I'd like to introduce technical session 2, The Future of Nuclear Energy, moderated by Raúl Bertero from Academia Nacional de Ingeniería, Argentina. Welcome to CAETS in Argentina to the technical session number two, The Future of Nuclear Energy. My name is Raúl Bartero, member of the Engineering National Academy of Argentina. This beautiful blue planet is jeopardized by the climate change. We know that we have to go to a low carbon economy and technology. Nuclear energy is one of the most effective solutions to control the climate change. Base energy, apart flexibility and stability to complement solar and wind energy. There are new technologies to reduce risk and manage nuclear waste. The small modular reactor means flexible and affordable power generation and offer the possibility to combine nuclear with alternative energy sources, including renewables. We have today a panel of extraordinary experts to share their knowledge about the future of nuclear energy. The curriculum of the, for the speakers are available on the CAES 2021 website for consultation. The opening presentation will be given by Mr. Rafael Grossi, General Director of the International Atomic Energy Agency. He will give us reason for optimism tackling climate change through advances in nuclear technology and policy. Then, Professor Xian Gen Zhao from the Chinese Academy of Energy of Engineering, also a member of the Committee of National People's Congress of China, give us an update of the energy program decarbonization of China and the important role of the nuclear energy in this program. After that, after that, Mr. Nudurupati Saibaba from Indian National Academy of Engineering introduced uh, us with an update of the India nuclear development. Finally, Dr. Sol Pedre, manager of the CAREN, the small modular reactor 100% designed and building in Argentina for the Atomic Energy National Commission will close this session. At the end, we have a virtual technical tool to the current and to the, our nuclear power plants in Atucha near Buenos Aires. I would like to encourage the audience, the audience to submit written question to the panel through the Zoom chat during this meeting. And we will address them after the presentation. With you, the opening presentation from Rafael Grossi. I am pleased to be with you today and I thank the Academia Nacional de Ingeniería de la República Argentina for their kind invitation. Last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published the first part of its sixth assessment report. The cold, hard data underpin what this summer's wildfires and floods are telling us. We must think big. We must act quickly. My message to you is this. To do so, we will need all low carbon energy sources. Nuclear must has been, is, and will be part of the solution. Not everyone agrees. Kite's latest report, for example, describes nuclear power as, quote unquote, a misleading solution. I disagree. And in the next minutes, I hope to show you why. At the International Atomic Energy Agency, my colleagues and I work with the world's most comprehensive and up-to-date library of global data. And every day, we participate in and witness nuclear's global advances. 
Technological progress is only possible through the collaboration of engineers and scientists like you. But for wider adoption of nuclear power, the decisions of lawmakers are also crucial. Nuclear must be put on an equal footing with other clean energy technologies. And I believe we are seeing this happen. Progress is made when decisions about nuclear are based on science rather than ideology. As the world's center for the cooperation in the nuclear field, the IAEA plays an indispensable role in facilitating this. When I look at the aggregate data, the work being done on policy and technology is adding up to real progress. But before we look at progress, let us first examine the opportunity and the challenge we face. Even though more people than ever have access to electricity, almost 800 million people still don't. Many countries remain dependent on burning, carbon-emitting fuels. CO2 emissions are generally declining in high-income countries, but rising in poorer nations. People in Eastern Asia are particularly exposed to the air pollution caused by fossil fuel waste. They make up almost a third of the 8 million of us who die each year because of the dirty air we breathe. Finding reliable, sustainable energy to fuel our economies is key to improving all our lives. As you know, our global reliance, reliance on fossil fuels has stayed stubbornly unchanged since 1980. In 2019, it still produced 63% of our electricity. This is unsustainable. When you think that electricity production is to double as our energy needs increase nearly 40% by 2050. This means that we are working against the clock to shift to a low-carbon energy future. Countries around the world have drafted national plans highlighting climate actions, including climate-related targets, policies and measures that governments aim to implement in response to climate change. Many, like those in the eastern part of Europe and Asia, are looking to reduce their reliance on coal. The use of wind and solar is growing. This raises the question of how we replace the oil and gas that provides grid stability and flexibility when demand changes and when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. During the pandemic, we saw the benefits of nuclear reliability and flexibility. As we went into lockdown, electricity demand fell by 10% globally and nuclear plants responded by carrying their loads. In France, for example, the number of nuclear load variations were up by 50%. Nuclear has a long track record of steadfast service. 67 years after the first reactor sent electricity to a grid, the sector has reached 19,000 reactor years of operations. Together, nuclear and hydro have provided the world with the vast majority of its low carbon generation. By using nuclear power, we have avoided 74 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent to the emissions of the entire power sector for 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. In the past decade, nuclear power capacity has gradually increased, shaking off the impact of both the 2008 financial crisis and the accident at Fukushima in 2010. It is still reducing carbon dioxide emissions around the world by more than one gigaton each year. France and Sweden have used nuclear together with hydropower to decarbonize almost all their electricity, putting them ahead of others in meeting their climate goals. 
Today, 443 nuclear power reactors operate in 32 countries. They produce about 10% of the world's electricity and almost one-third of the world's low-carbon electricity. It is true that a handful of countries in Western Europe are phasing out nuclear. Every country has a sovereign right to choose its energy mix, but focusing too closely on one sub-region can skew our overall view. Even in Europe, half of the countries still operate nuclear power plants, and eight are either building more or seriously considering it. Near and long term, the biggest capacity growth will come in Asia, where 34 reactors are under construction as I speak. Around the world, 51 reactors are being built and about 30 countries are considering introducing nuclear power. Based on their current national plans, 10 to 12 nuclear newcomers are expected by 2035. The IAEA helps make this possible. Our integrated nuclear infra infrastructure review missions help countries assess their individual situations. Since 2009, 32 such missions have their follow-ups and their follow-ups have been conducted in 22 countries. We also help in other key areas including financial management, the capacity building and stakeholder engagement. Our annual projections show that nuclear power will continue to play a key role in the world's low-carbon energy mix. Under the high-case scenario, IEA analysts expect capacity to increase 82% by 2050. But we will need more, even more nuclear, if we are to mitigate climate change. The International Energy Agency's Net Zero Roadmap says nuclear generation will need to double by 2050. Meanwhile, the IPCC developed four pathways to achieving our critical 1.5 degree goal. They include the need for nuclear power generation to increase between 60 and 500 percent by 2050, depending on demand and alternate supply options. Like for other energy technology, Nuclear will have to keep making breakthroughs to meet that need. One significant advance clearing the path for the future of nuclear is the industry's success in answering the question of what to do with the waste. Last year, I saw this solution with my own eyes when I visited the Onkalo repository in Finland. In a couple of years, it will receive and keep safe high-level high waste from 50 years of clean energy energy generation in Finland. Several other countries such as France and Sweden are also making significant progress in this area. Meanwhile, Russia, China, India, the United States and others are at varying stages in the operation and development of fast and new generation reactors. Fast nuclear reactors can extract up to 70 times more energy from uranium, thereby reducing the need to tap new resources. The small modular reactors could offer an option for smaller electricity grids. And since you are in Argentina, the CAREM is a good example of a prototype and I'm glad to see it is featured in today's program. There is much excitement that SMRs could better serve the needs of developing countries. And, I, and if they are used for non-electric applications, such for example as producing hydrogen, we could reach tough to decarbonize sectors, including transport and industry. The IAEA fosters this kind of innovation by providing a global platform to share information, by supporting technology development and deployment, by coordinating research projects, publishing technical papers and databases, and by developing and adopting standards. In nuclear, and in other energy sectors, breakthroughs take time. But climate scientists warn us that we have little time left to drastically cut our greenhouse emissions if we are to avoid the most devastating consequences of climate change. Fortunately, we have a tried 
and tested solution, extending the operation of existing nuclear power plants at a levelized cost, cost of 30 to 35 per megawatt hour, adding 10 to 20 years to a nuclear power plant is one of our most cost-effective low carbon options we have. The IEA supports member states in the long-term operation of their nuclear power plants through peer review services and publications, as well as through training and assistance in improving plant life management. As advances in all manner of nuclear technologies are made, we lay the groundwork so that they can be developed and deployed safely and securely. For example, we have just launched an initiative that assists member states in all aspects of SMRs and microreactors, including technology development and deployment, infrastructure, economics, safety and regulatory issues, security and safeguards, all of them together. In all things nuclear, we reach thousands of people each year across the world through networks and partnerships with laboratories, scientists, universities and experts. These networks pass on crucial information about how to use nuclear material safely and how to keep it out of the hands of people who may want to sow us harm. I suspect you also know us as the world's nuclear watchdog. The work of our safeguards teams is vital in keeping world peace. Together, with our work on safety and security, it underpins the public confidence required so that nuclear can benefit all. The benefits of nuclear go well beyond energy. The IAA assists countries in using, in using nuclear techniques to do things like detect and battle diseases such as COVID-19 or cancer. We help our member states use nuclear techniques techniques to assess aquifers and to boost harvests. In fact, the peaceful uses of nuclear technologies are so varied that they help countries in the pursuit of nine of the 17 sustainable development goals as defined by the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, CAETS and the IAEA are similar in that they are facilitators of knowledge exchanges. I'm grateful that CAETS brings together engineers and experts from across the world and from across the different energy sectors. This is very important. Too often nuclear is pitted against wind and solar and other forms of energy. The answer to our challenges is not either or but all. That is why events like this one are important. There is much we can learn from each other and much we can do together. In closing, I would like to dedicate my final words to an issue I believe many of us feel strongly about. At the IAEA, we believe in equal opportunities and that diverse teams lead to better outcomes. One of the first things I did as Director General is launch the Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellowship Program. The inaugural 100 women fellows have already received financial support towards their master's degrees in a variety of nuclear subjects. We have just called for the second round of applications and I thank you for helping us to get the message out. I'm an optimist, and I hope I have given you reasons for optimism, even among the challenges we face. We must actively build the future we want to see. Therefore, let us invest in nuclear and in a new generation of scientists and engineers who will help us to keep the breakthroughs coming. Thank you. Hello, colleagues 
of the engineer academies around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to meet you online. Thanks, Kate, and the National Academy of Engineers of Argentina for inviting me to speak in this important conference. I'm Dao Xiangen from the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and it's my great honor to deliver a presentation about China's nuclear energy and the National Society of Carbon Utility. My presentation has three parts. Part one is about China's national goals of a carbon emissions peak and a carbon neutrality. It's widely accepted. The 21st century will see carbon neutrality. As of the first half of this year, more than 130 countries have announced their carbon neutrality goals. These countries account for over 65% of the global total greenhouse gas emissions and more than 75% of the global total GDP. All of these countries make different progress in promoting carbon neutrality. Most of them have announced that they will strive to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. As I can be seen from the figure, after nearly 100 years of development, Europe, the United States, Japan, and other major developed countries around the world have completed their industrialization journey. Their domestic energy intensive industries have either exited or been transferred to other countries. So their economic growth has basically been decoupled from energy demand. However, China is the largest developing country in the world. It is still on the road to industrialization and urbanization. China's primary energy consumption still shows a growth trade, and carbon emissions are also on the rise. The goal of achieving carbon emissions peak in a short term will largely affect China's economic and social development. Even so, China is a responsible major country. And at the 1750 session of the United Nations General Assembly last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping made a solemn statement to the world. China will scale up its intended nationally determined contributions by adopting more vigorous policies and measures. We aim to have carbon emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Next, I will share part two of my presentation, actions for carbon emissions peak and carbon neutrality. In 2017, China issued the energy production and a consumption revolution strategy, indicating that China must establish a clear and low carbon and secure and efficient energy system and implement the national energy strategy of four revolutions and one cooperation. In addition, China will accelerate the establishment of an energy supply system that features complementary and coordinated development of coal, oil, gas, nuclear energy, new energy, and renewable energy. In March 2021, 
the 13th National People's Congress as China's organ of superior power, has the outline of the 14th five-year plan and the long-range objectives through the year 2035 of China, which will be the highest plan of action to guide China's development in the next five years and even 15 years. The outline also involves a top-level plan for specific actions in the economic and the social development process. China needs to play the implementation path of a carbon emissions peak and carbon neutrality in such key aspects as industrial restructure, energy development, and power investment, and the research specific measures for carbon emission reduction by taking the actual development conditions of industry, buildings, transportation, and other fields into consideration. After sharing the top level designs of the Chinese government, I will take China's carbon emissions trade scheme established recently as an example to briefly introduce some preliminary practice of China to promote the decisive role of the market in the allocation of carbon emissions. At the end of 2020, the Ministry of Quality and Environment of China passed the regulation on carbon emissions trading. I mean at regulating carbon, carbon emissions trading and related activities across the country. In July 2021, the online platform for China's national carbon emissions trading market was officially launched. This represents a major system innovation of a limited market mechanism to control and reduce GHG emissions and promote green and low carbon development and also a significant policy tool for achieving the carbon emissions peak goal and the carbon neutrality vision. It is worth mentioning that more than 2,000 key carbon emitters in the power generation sector have been included in this national market and that about 4.5 billion tons of a carbon dioxide have been covered. This makes it the world's largest carbon trading market. In the process of establishing the carbon emissions trading scheme, our largest data on the enterprises as the main market participants proactively promote clean and low carbon energy development, continuously optimize industrial structure and speed up the development and the deployment of low carbon technologies. China's major think tanks are also offering advice and suggestions on how the country can achieve their goals of a carbon emissions peak and a carbon neutrality in a high quality world. They say that I work for is a high and thinking tank in the field of engineering science and technology. Our organization has grasped grasp the key words that the goal of a carbon neutrality by 2060 will have extensive and the profound economic and the social impacts in a systematic way. And put forward that our country needs to make in deep researchers on the pace for how to achieve the goal of building a modern country 
and they achieve the goals of a carbon emissions peak and carbon neutrality in a coordinated way. According to CAE, energy transition is the main path to carbon neutrality. There are some specific measures need to be considered. One, improving the carbon markets and establishing a carbon emissions management system. Two, giving priority to energy saving and accelerating the replacement of electricity from fossil fuels at the end user side. Three, speeding up the development of distributed energy systems and gradually building a new power system and supporting service system adapted to a large scale development of renewable energy. Four, adhering to the innovation driven approach and developing major scientific and technological innovation projects and platforms. And five, developing green finance to support the energy transition. In part three of this presentation, I will explain the role of nuclear energy in achieving China's national strategy of a carbon neutrality. We think that the nuclear power will play an increasingly important role in China's energy structure. As clearly indicated in the report on the work of the government 2021, China will take active and well ordered steps to develop nuclear energy on the basis of ensuring its safe use. By the end of 2020, a total of 49 nuclear power reactors were in operation in mainland China, with a total installed capacity of 51 million kilowatts. The nuclear power plants that have been in operation have power output of 366 billion kilowatt hours accounting for 5% of the China's total power output. All nuclear power plants have a very good track record in operation. In 2020, only one level one event on the international nuclear event scale occurred, and no event at the above level one occurred. 2021 represents the first year of China's 14th five-year plan period. In this five years, China will see more remarkable important improvement in nuclear energy development. China's plans have stated that the country will safely and reliably promote the construction of nuclear power plants in coastal areas, and there is the installed capacity of nuclear power reactors in operation will rise to 17 gigawatts. In addition, the relevant studies of CAE also make proactive suggestions on making further efforts to develop nuclear energy in the 14th five-year plan period. China's nuclear power development is expected to be appropriately accelerated. Specifically, six to eight nuclear power reactors should be approved for construction every year. The subsequent instead capacity of a nuclear power were to account for at least 10% of China's total. And the nuclear power output needed to make up more than 20% of China's total. 
in addition, we also su suggest to expand the demonstration of other nuclear energy applications, such as heating, say water desalination and hydrogen production. These ideas highly echo the views of the French Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Technologies of France. Therefore, the three economies of two countries conduct two phases of a joint program on the development of a nuclear energy. In 2017, the three economies of the two countries carried out the phase one of the joint program on the development and the safety of a nuclear energy. In 2018, the three economies made joint researchers on phase two, nuclear and armament. The common understandings between three economies mainly include one, produce very few GHG emissions. Nuclear energy is one of the most effective solutions to combat the global environmental problems of climate change. Two, nuclear energy has small negative impacts on the environment. And even if a severe accident occurs, the environmental impacts are still limited. Three, the waste from nuclear energy could be properly disposed of. Four, the deployment of a new technologies can effectively prevent the occurrence of a severe accident. Five, nuclear energy is a clean and sustainable energy source. To sum up, we believe that the nuclear energy is an important contributor to China's national security and energy security. It's a clean and low carbon and a secure and efficient base load energy form. Nuclear energy will play an increasingly important role in supporting China's national strategy of achieving the goals of a carbon emissions peak and carbon neutrality. The Chinese people have also realized that the stable and sustained development of a nuclear energy is indispensable to the goal of building China into a modern country. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. I hope that the academies of all countries can join hands to make new contributions to combating climate change and reducing carbon emissions. Wish you good health in this year when the COVID-19 epidemic is still not over. Thank you. I'm really grateful to INEA for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation to Gates in this prestigious conference. And I also thank the organizers of Gates, Argentina, and also all the people involved in this uh, organization. And uh, I'm so pleased to be a part of you. My presentation is on the status of nuclear power in India as on date. India has been pursuing a robust three-stage nuclear power program as outlined by Dr. Tomi Jahangir Baba. It's based on self-reliance and also exploitation of vast thorium reserves and domestic industrial capabilities in this country. 
if you see the figure, our first stage is basically of PHWR type, pressurized heavy water reactors. In this pressurized heavy water reactors, we use natural uranium and uh, all the reactors use this natural uh, uranium and, and convert the uh, U-238 into useful plutonium. The selection of uh, PHWRs has been done because of its high efficiency in producing plutonium, which is required for the next stage. Also, it, it gave an opportunity to us to produce most of the components within the country. It's not very difficult to produce the reactor components. And third one is most important one is the reactor is very economical. Today, if you see the cheapest reactor in the world is PHWR. And in this, as I mentioned, the used fuel, the spent fuel is processed to produce separate out plutonium and uranium-238. And the, whatever is left out uranium-238 is in good quantity because you know most of the part, natural uranium contains U-238. So these two becomes a fuel for the next stage FBTR reactors. But for FBTR reactors to start, we must have enough plutonium. That means the base or the fleet of PHWRs has to be quite substantial so that we have enough quantity of plutonium to start the number of fast breeder reactors. So the second stage basically uses the plutonium and also uses some blankets after a certain time uh, of thorium, which we have in abundance. But here we are not looking for increasing the consumption of thorium, but to increase our breeder capacity. In other words, how much of uranium-238 can be converted further into, uh, into uranium-233 or thorium is converted into U-233, not the blankets. And uh, this U-233 will be useful for the next stage or the third stage, the final stage. And if you see, uh, the depleted uranium and plutonium are going to plutonium-based fast reactors. In this fast reactors, we basically use plutonium-uranium oxide fuel, or one can use the carbide fuel. We have used it for the test reactor that we have uh, commissioned in our uh, uh, country in the year 1985. It has successfully run for several years, almost like more than 30 years it has successfully run. And that gave us enough experience to run FBRs. And now, right now, we are in a bond stage of commissioning a prototype fast breeder reactor of 500 megawatt capacity. And once it is successful, we'll go with a fleet of FBRs. And so that whatever breeding takes place, it will be useful for increasing our base of uh, FBRs. And from here, whatever U-233 is produced, it will be used for the third stage, and the third stage basically are a number of reactors. The number one is advanced heavy water reactor. It uses uh, heavy water as moderator, but uh, coolant is uh, light water. And uh, it has uh, many passive safety systems, and it's a very efficient one. And the thorium reactor, it can utilize a lot of uh, uh, our resources. And basically, it can be used for many purposes, not only for the power, but also for many other purposes, such as hydrogen production or uh, for processing water requirement, etc. Now, the same one, if you want to convert in terms of how many reactors we have right now, we have uh, uh, the in the first stage, 18 operating reactors of PHWRs and five under construction. And, uh, Two BWRs supplied by General Electric long, long ago, maybe 50 years ago, and uh, this commission more than 50 years ago, and two BWRs of Russian uh, manufacture, and they're operating in Kudankulam of Tamil Nadu in India. And these are operating reactors of uh, LWRs, but uh, four more are under construction right now. 
And there are many more reactors coming up, which I will uh, explain in the next uh, slides. Let me go to the second stage of our PRs. We have a 40 megawatt thermal FETR, as I mentioned. It has been operating for more than 30 years. And a 500 megawatt PFDR under construction, advanced stage. And it has a huge potential of up to 300 gigawatts. Once we increase the base to 300 gigawatts, then we can start converting or using this material for uh, sustaining a, a, a large production of uh, power, something like 600 gigawatts. And here, uh, the apart from AHWRs, we also have molten salt reactors in the under design, and uh, they are in advanced stage, and they are all going on parallelly. And high temperature reactors also are being considered, and this has huge potential uh, of the third stage. And the theme of nuclear power program is self-reliance through R&D. This is our hallmark. And as I explained to you, three-stage power program is based on moderate uranium. We, have, we don't have huge resources of uranium, but abundant thorium resources. And plan is based on closed nuclear fuel cycle. In other words, we don't leave any gram of fissile or fertile material. The spent fuel is reprocessed to plutonium and residual uranium which fuels the breeder reactors, and uh, PHWR is selected for its uh, efficient production of PU. And uh, operating nuclear power reactors, India is the first country in Asia to operate a nuclear reactor. And presently, we have 22 reactors producing about 7,520 7, megawatts energy, which constitutes about 3% of our total energy production in India. So the same is, uh, you know, PHWRs, we have uh, 18 of them, and then uh, four at the LWRs, yeah. And now upcoming nuclear power reactors, as I mentioned, the government of India has uh, sanctioned recently uh, 10 reactors, you know, uh, as a fleet mode, which has uh, several advantages. A fleet mode uh, 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 approval permits us to procure our materials at a very reasonable and economical uh, prices because the, cost, the supplier can plan for 10 sets at a time. It can be delivered at different times, but he can plan for 10 sets. Earlier till now, he is not sure whether he will get the first set only and not, not the second set, or may or may not get the second set, or in future what happens. So he is not able to uh, really have a commercial production, or his activities cannot be extended for, at, for continuously for a long time. So this fleet mode, uh, you know, of uh, 10 reactors of all 700 uh, uh, capacity, it gives so much of uh, leverage for NPCIL, who, who is uh, the organization in India, to commission these reactors. And similarly, light water reactors, we have uh, right now uh, two more, as I mentioned to you, two are commissioned, two are under advanced stage of uh, construction, two are being started right now. So totally there are about six LWRs. So the LWRs under planning for future, we have several uh, LWRs planned under BBR type, at least uh, so many more, uh, 10 more numbers. And EPR of uh, France, uh, we have uh, six numbers. A lot of discussions are going on and uh, progress is being made. And at the same time, it's not uh, resulting in the final uh, success. And uh, AP-1000 is also being considered from Westinghouse. And of course, VBRs is uh, predominantly is successful because uh, it's, uh, it's going on smoothly. The commissioning is also happening very, very successfully. And expansion of our uh, nuclear power program, as I mentioned to you, uh, in by 2050, we want to have about uh, 40 total PSWRs in position. Out of this, half of them will be running on Indian uh, uranium, indigenous uranium, and uh, the remaining half will be on imported uranium. So that's how we will have about 20 gigawatts of uh, 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 power produced through PSWR out of 65 uh, gigawatts planned. And LWRs, as, you, as I mentioned to you right just now, that the, uh, we have been, been very successful with uh, the erection commissioning of all the Russian reactors. 
and a lot of discussions are going with them that part of these uh, components will be manufactured in India. And the extent of uh, indigenization is increasing uh, with every reactor being set up here. And fast breeder reactors, nine of them are, are, are being planned, each of 500 megawatt capacity. And this is what we are planning for uh, 2050. This is, uh, will give us a modest 65 gigawatts of uh, nuclear power. So the same thing I'm just mentioning why of it, the energy consumption per capita in India is 1208, 1208 kilowatt hours, which is about three times lower than the world average. And so in order to increase uh, to the world level and also to consider the increasing uh, demands over the years, the population is increasing, the production is increasing, the GDP is increasing, demand, putting demands on power. So the nuclear has to take up the responsibility partly. And by 2050, some of the present reactors also will be decommissioned. So this has to be compensated. So the, what are the constraints in achieving the desired objectives of 65 gigawatts by 2050? Funds, definitely the funds required of use and there's a lot of problems. Sites, I'm going to explain. Uranium, there is no problem as on today. Uranium, we have enough uranium and whatever uh, reactors we are going to import the fuel. For that, there are a good number of uh, suppliers like uh, uh, Kazakhstan or uh, Canada. Steel, we, we need huge quantities of steel and cement and industrial support, though the industrial support has been there, but once we increase or change the lever or the gear and to go into faster mode of implementation, the industrial support also becomes critical. There are many other infrastructural requirements such as the manpower is also a very huge thing. And there are several other factors which have to be in place to, to make this dream come true. About the sites, so India is densely populated country and so it's very difficult to find potential sites for nuclear power plants. So what we are doing is maximum utilization of the sets sites already uh, you know, in place. And so we are locating multiple number of units and co-locating even other facilities such as fuel fabrication, heavy water, et cetera. And sites for PHWRs, there are several like Kakarpara, Gujarat, Kota, uh, Rajasthan, Mitividhi also, and uh, Banswara, uh, Gorakhpur, Haryana, Chutka, uh, and uh, Barsi, Barsi in Madhya Pradesh, Kaiga in Karnataka. If you see these sites, most of the sites where already the reactors exist. And so we are only expanding and locating so many other reactors in the same place. And sites for LWRs is uh, like Kudankulam and uh, Kavali. Kavali is in Andhra Pradesh and uh, Jetapur, Mithibiddi and Kovada. So these are the places we have already located, but there are some problems uh, like for FBRs, we need to be located on coastal uh, areas. And uh, uh, the, this, this requires huge water uh, requirements. So uh, finding suitable sites is likely to pose a problem or it's a challenge. So we have to solve this because our coastal line is heavily populated. FBRs one and two, uh, we have already decided to locate them at Kalpakam and uh, already where number of reactors are there. Well, but that's where PFBR and MBT are also working there. Kamini is also there. So we have to also locate facilities such as fuel production facilities, reprocessing and uh, waste management plants and sodium and boron production and many other things. And capacity addition, plan through existing well-developed reactor fuel cycle technologies and uh, with inputs from industries. So the PHWRs reached the stage of maturity and uh, we have done uh, demonstration in indigenization, uh, standardization and commercialization and availability factors are very, very high. And uh, some of the reactors have run for a number of years continuously and without stopping. So this uh, shows the maturity of the technology. And uh, so we have moved from 220 megawatt capacity to 540 and then two reactors at Tarapur have been running for the last 10 years or more. And now we are going to 700 megawatt size 
the first one is at is at the kakarpara gujarat and uh, now all our fusion reactors we are planning of this size and this can be run on natural uranium as uh, is originally planned but also we can run on reprocessed uranium and the most important thing is scu once we use scu or uh, low enrichment uh, uranium then the waste that will be generated or the waste uh, fuel waste will also come down drastically to 30 to 40 percent and uh, the the life of the uh, the the, uh, the capacities also are going to go up and so uh, we have uh, experience with seu we have run for quite number of years and we have generated sufficient data on this so we are confident of using seu in our reactors and uh, this lowest specific capital cost as i said these are very economical and uh, a reactor typically one megawatt uh, would cost uh, around 150 millions of rupees. So fuel cycle facilities, uh, we are uh, having uranium mining and milling everywhere. We have about many sites all over the country. Fuel fabrication and core structures we have for PHWR, PWRs, and also for ASWRs, we have manufactured some of the core structures. And heavy water, we are self-sufficient and we are in fact, much more than our self-sufficient and reprocessing waste management we have uh, mature technology. With the international uh, cooperation, we are uh, product, we are going for LWR technology, as I mentioned, uh, about 40 gigawatts uh, we are going to produce through uh, LWR route. So we have gained a lot of experience through Pudan and Klum Russian reactors. And also now we are looking for uh, Areva France, Westinghouse and uh, Russian Federation. So the, the philosophy is low enriched fuel during the initial period will be imported uh, in the and in the long term, enrichment facilities and fuel fabrication facilities will be established in India. And many key equipments like reactor vessels, etc., steam generators will be indeed is nice because uh, steam generators we have a lot of experience. So we have no problem. Reactor vessels also we are putting higher uh, you know presses. And the spent fuel from LWRs will be cooled for about five years and reprocessed. Technology for reprocessing also exists with us. And fast breeder reactors, we are planning originally MOX, that is mixed oxide uh, uh, based fast breeder fuel. And the fuel from FBR core will be taken from uh, in batches and uh, reprocessed for extraction of PU and U streams that PureX process will use. And new assemblies will be made with this material for the same FBR. Surplus plutonium. Uh, is accumulated over a period will be used for the next reactor and uh, sufficient experience has been gathered over the last 30 years uh, of uh, reprocessing and uh, also operation of the fast speed test reactor and the most important thing is we are gearing up to use metallic fuel in future in mbrs which will reduce the doubling time uh, you know uh, substantially thank you Well, good afternoon. My name is Sol Pedre. I am the uh, project manager of the current project in, in the National Atomic Energy Commission of Argentina. And uh, today I will be presenting some of the main features and, and status of, the, of this uh, important nuclear project in, in our country. So basically Argentina has 70 years of very, very long experience in the nuclear field. We have, um, we have many, multi-purpose and, uh, and research reactors. We, we have also exported this type of reactors to many, many other countries. We have also a, a long tradition in nuclear medicine, and we have a very, a very long tradition in, in research on, in, nuclear, in nuclear energies and applications. And we also have three nuclear power plants already. We have two in, the, in, in, the, in Buenos Aires province, in, the, in, the, in Lima, that's very close to, to Buenos Aires, and, and one in, in Córdoba. These are heavy water reactors. We have two semen type reactors, Atucha 1 and Atucha, Atucha 2. These are unique in the complete world. And the reactor in, in, the, in Córdoba province is a Kandu reactor. That's a, a very widespread reactor in, in the world. And we have the complete um, um, we, we have the complete uh, fuel cycle from the, from the extraction of the uranium 
to the complete production of of these of these uh, fuel pellets and and fuel elements uh, for our for our nuclear power plant. So we are completely autonomous in in this in this type. So for our country, it is a it is a next step in in a very long tradition of of um, of nuclear power plant to build this uh, current uh, uh, prototype that will be the first nuclear power plant completely designed and built in Argentina. This uh, reactor is a small modular reactor uh, type. This is, a, this is a concept that has been developed in many countries in the world. We, were, we are one of the most advanced uh, projects. The idea of this type of, of modular reactor is to, to, in, to incorporate several um, several um, passive uh, security systems. There are small reactors that produce up to 300 megawatt uh, electric of, of, of power. And the idea is that you can be, uh, you can build these type of reactors in a, in a factory and then uh, take them to the, to the placing, to the final placing as, as modules that can be incrementally put one next to the another. So the idea is uh, that they are more simple because most many of the of the components that are usually outside of the reactor in in bigger reactors are now inside the pressure vessel you have this you have this capacity of putting one and and then another and then another that simplifies uh, the the need of of capital of of money to start up and and they they have very very um, important new security systems especially after the fukushima event so uh, what's what's our our prototype? We are um, we are um, the Argentina has um, taken a, a a way of of building this that's building a prototype to test the 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 to test the the innovations in this in this reactor. As I already said, this is the first nuclear power plant fluid, fluidly designed in Argentina. It's of pressure water pressure water reactor. It, it will produce 32 megawatts of, of energy, and it has this integrated uh, uh, primary system in, in, in the reactor. Uh, uh, different from our uh, from our other uh, nuclear power plants, this is an enriched uranium reactor. Uh, we are we already have this uh, this um, um, this type of reactors, but only for the research purposes. Our as I already told, our um, our nuclear power plants are all natural uranium and heavy water reactors, but uh, we, we can build the, 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 the fuels also in Argentina. So the, the aims of the prototype is to qualify the whole concept in a, in a smaller scale than the commercial or industrial units. Also to generate all the abilities we, are, we need to, to take this, this type of project in the National Atomic Energy Commission and all its associated companies the nuclear sector in Argentina is a very, it's a, it's a really an ecosystem. We have several, uh, we have five um, companies that are dedicated to different, uh, different parts of the, of the nuclear, of the nuclear uh, cycle. Uh, we have Nucleotic Argentina, that's the one that operates the power plants. We have um, Conuar that makes the, the fuels, FAE that makes the special elations for the fuels, Dioxitec that makes the, um, makes them, uh, uranium dioxide capsules for the fuels, and of course, INVAP, that's also another company has has uh, springed from from the National Atomic Energy Commission. But also, we have very very small, uh, very very big uh, and and small companies that make the metal metal mechanical components for this type of reactors. So, the idea is in with the prototype to develop these abilities, and uh, that that already exist in Argentina, uh, to to then. So we can escalate afterwards to an to a commercial uh, unit that we can sell, hopefully around the world. That's the next aim: is to repeat the success we have already obtained with the research reactors exportation. We have exported these type of reactors to Argelia, to Egypt, now to Holland, to Australia. So so we have already an, an uh, uh, a road made in this type of 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 exports, and of course to to become a worldwide reference for this new generation of nuclear reactors that are already that are really new and there's uh, today there are there are no ex examples of uh, of these type of reactors working in in the world so basically this was uh, what i was already saying um 
a normal PWR has the steam generators, the pressurizer, the control rod mechanisms, the pumps all outside the pressure vessel. This makes, uh, th this has the need of having all these um, pipes that take the water from the primary system that has, that is in contact with the radiative, the radiative nucleus outside of the reactor. This, this, um, this is a, is a, is a problem because if these uh, pipes break, then we have an accident. So the idea of these new reactors is to include the steam generators, uh, the control rod mechanisms, to and have a natural circulation that makes that uh, the main pumps are not needed, and the pressurizer is inside of the of the pressure vessel. So we have a, a smaller design, more uh, integral, that that is naturally more safe. So this is basically the building we have today that we are building now in, in, in Lima next to Atucha 1 and Atucha 2 power plants. I will show you some pictures later on. We have the reactor building that has the containment and of course the, the spent fuel pools. I, you can see here, the, here's the containment, here's the spent fuel pools and all the safety and process systems and the control room that, that is here. We have the service building that will have all the offices and the changing rooms and also the emergency control uh, room and the balance, of, the balance of plants we have to produce the energy that we will be connected to the to the electric grid where the what well, the turbine is the electric generator and the condenser that completes the the power plant well you can see here for the for the civil engineers we have a very very big containment uh, it's a 1.2 meters thick reinforced concrete external wall it has an internal liner that's um, that's uh, to, to prevent any any gases from leaking in any type of accident. It has a design pressure of five bar and a design temperature of 155 uh, degrees Celsius. And here you can see the, the, the liner. It's a very, in, very interesting piece of engineering. It's a very, very um, uh, thin uh, steel uh, line. That has been built also in Argentina in by the Conoir uh, enterprise that 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 provides the security that no in an in event of any of any uh, accident no gases will be uh, will be vented to the atmosphere. A very important characteristic of the small modular reactors and and the current project in particular is the is the passive system safety systems. This means that. That, the, that in the event of an accident, the reactor is kept cool for, for a, a period of time without the need of human intervention or electric power. And the only, only natural forces like gravity are in, 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 in place for these systems to work. In the current uh, reactor, this, this gives us a window of 36 hours after an accident without, without any need of human intervention. And after that, uh, you can extend this period with only, only connecting some some water into into the into the containment. Um, this is very important. Um, there are many 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 of these these systems, and this is very important, especially after the Fukushima accident. Um, this was new regulatory uh, things that were included after the Fukushima accident for all the nuclear power plants in design in in the world. But we, in the current project, we already had these type of systems, so so we didn't have to change our design. To comply with this new regulatory um, uh, uh, guidelines. Okay, th this is very important for a country of Argentina. The nuclear uh, sector has always, uh, in Argentina, has always been be very, very related to the development of a uh, of a strong industry. As I already explained, we have uh, from the National Atomic Energy Commission, we have. Five very five big companies that were uh, built from from this the, the ones that are uh, directly related to the nuclear power plants uh, and the and the nuclear activity, but there's also a lot of other companies that work in the in the in the fabrication of, of this type of, of supplies needed for the nuclear industry, special especially metal mechanical companies, and. Uh, and this is uh, one of the main reasons of, of why Argentina as a country does this type of projects. We have over 1,000 local suppliers for this for our projects. Over 19% of the money we already spent 
has been of national origin and the projected uh, total amount is over 70% of localization. All the design is being done in Argentina, the basic design and, and the detail, detail design also. And the very important thing is that ma the main supplies, the main uh, big metal mechanical components are also national. We will see some pictures uh, now in the, in the next slide. So you can see the, the stature, the, the state of these of this, um, this components. The pressure vessel is being done in Argentina in the IMSA company in, in Mendoza. The steam generators are being built in Argentina in Conuar. That's in, in Ezeiza. The liner has also been built by Conuar in Argentina, the main crane is being built by a company named Cecin, also in Argentina. And all the large mechanical components will be built in Argentina. We are starting uh, probably next year to, to build most of the companies with IMSA and, 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 and also with, a, with, a, with also smaller companies nucleated in the ADIMRA um, Association, that's the Metal, Metal Mechanical Association of, of, of companies in Argentina. Of course, the civil works are done in Argentina, the electromechanical assemblies are done in, are done in Argentina, and also the commissioning. Uh, we have already ex, uh, invested around $450 billion. This includes the, the need of uh, rebuilding many of the, of the, of the places and the and engineering uh, teams in Argentina. And the current budget will be is approximately $800 million and we have an estimated progress of 59%. Now I will show you the state, the status of some of these things. And I know you will see a video later on uh, that also shows many of these things. So this is the reactor building that's been built in, in, in the Lima city. We have recently signed a contract with Nucleotic Argentina that will finish the civil works and we will be mobilizing the, the um, the, 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 the finishing of these works uh, probably in December. And they would make a lot of people to start working from, from the local uh, place. This is, this is, the progress is estimated in 70%. You can see there the containment and the liner. You can, there, here are some also pictures. They are, in these pictures, they are, they are mounting the, the liner over, over the, the containment. This is uh, several, several modules that are mounted one in, step, in front of the other. Here you can see the uh, office is building and here is the turbine building that's also uh, being built. In this picture, you can also see the, the reactor building, the offices building and the turbine building. You can see here the, the containment liner, the estimated progress is 87%. We are, we are currently finishing the, the, the last modules of this liner. This is being built by Conuar. That's a, a very specialized nuclear company that was, that was um, created by Conea uh, and it's in the, the CESA Atomic Center. This is the, the reactor pressure vessel. You can see it's a very uh, interesting piece of engineering. This is being built by IMSA in, in Mendoza, in the Mendoza province, and it has an estimated progress of 58%. And well, you can see here the, the steam generators. The steam generators are very particular. They are helicoidal. This is very different from, from, the, from the normal. Uh, reactors that have U-shaped uh, steam generators. These are um, each of the tubes of the steam generators is 30 meters long for and it has no uh, weldings, has no welds. And so we had to <laughs> build a special furnace to make this this very 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 long and and, and uh, tubes. And each steam generator has 52 of these tubes. And, and as, as, as you can see, they are, they are, they, we have 12 steam generators inside the pressure vessel. And this steam generator is also being built in Argentina by Conuar. And uh, the, the special aliations for the, for the tubes were built by FAE. That's also an, another nuclear company, all built in Argentina. The estimated progress is 52%, but uh, the good news is what we, we, we will be finishing uh, a, a one uh, of a kind a steam generator to test uh, in February of next year. So we can test that this, uh, this has been um, 
well built because this is the first time <laughs> an helicoidal steam generator of this type is being built in, in the world. So there are many uh, technical details and, and, and fabrication details. The balance of plant is also in a 63% estimated progress. We already have the tyre and several of the of the components. We will be producing energy for for the interconnected electrical system in Argentina. And the fuels assemblies, we are they are also being built in Argentina uh, by Conuar also, and we have an estimated progress of 56%. So this is made, made the main components and the main status of, of the project. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, we are open to any questions you may have.